chapter seventeen of the forbidden way by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva old rose leaves camilla wrote nothing to jeff about her illness it was nothing very serious the doctor said only a fashionable case of nerves the type was common the medicine rest and quiet he commended his own sanitarium where he could assure her luxury and the very best society but camilla refused she wanted to be alone and so she denied herself to callers cancelled all her engagements and took the rest cure in her own way she slept late in the mornings took her medicine conscientiously put herself on a diet and in the afternoon with her maid only for company took long motor rides in the country to out-of-the-way places on roads where she would not be likely to meet her acquaintances she knew what it was that she needed it wasn't the strychnia tonic the doctor had prescribed or even the rest cure the more she was alone the more time she had to think it was in moments like the present in the morning hours in her own rooms that she felt that she could not forget there was no longer the hum of well-bred voices about her no music the glamour of lowered lights or the odour of embowered roses to distract her mind or soothe her senses in the morning hours jeff was present with her in the flesh everything about her reminded her of him the desk at which he had worked with its pigeonholes full of papers in the reckless disorder which was characteristic of him the corn-cob pipe which he had refused to discard the durham tobacco in its cotton bag beside a government report on mining the specimens of ore from the lone tree which he had always used as paperweights the brass bowl into which he had knocked his ashes and the photograph in its jewelled frame of herself in sombrero and kerchief taken at meyer's photograph gallery in mesa city at the time when she had taught school before jeff's dreams had come true she took the picture up and examined it closely it was the picture of a girl sitting on a table a lariat in one hand and a quirt in the other and the background presented mesa city's idea of an italian villa with fluted columns backed by some palms and a vista of lake how well she remembered that gray painted screen and the ornate wicker chair and table which were its inevitable accompaniment they had served as a background for pete mulrennan in prince albert coat when he was elected mayor for jack williams the foreman of the lazy l ranch and his bride from kinney for mrs brennan in her new black silk dress for the harbison twins and their cherubic mother she put the photograph down and her head sank forward on her arms in mute rebellion in her sleep she had murmured court's name and jeff had heard her but she knew that in itself this was not enough to have caused the breach what else had he heard jeff had tired of her that was all had tired of being married to a graven image to a mere semblance of the woman he had thought she was she could not blame him for that it was his right to be tired of her if he chose it was the sudden revelation of the actual state of her mind with regard to courtland which had given her the first suggestion of her true bearings that and the careless chatter of the people of their set in which mrs cheyne was leading courtland had guessed the truth which she had been so resolutely hiding from herself she loved jeff had always loved him 
and would until the end of time like the chemist who for months has been seeking the solution of a problem she had found the acid which had magically liberated the desired element the acid was jealousy and after all dangerous vapors had passed love remained in the retort elemental and undefiled the simplicity of the revelation was as beautiful as it was mystifying had she by some fortuitous accident succeeded in transmuting some baser metal into gold she could not have been more bewildered of course jeff could not know to him she was still the graven image the pretty idol the symbol of what might have been how could he guess that his idol had been made flesh and blood that now she waited for him no longer a symbol of lost illusions but just a woman his wife she raised her head at last sighed deeply and put the photograph in the drawer of the desk as she did so the end of a small battered tin box protruded she remembered it at once for in it jeff had always kept the letters and papers which referred to his birth and babyhood she had looked them over before with jeff but it was almost with a feeling of timidity at an intrusion that she took the box out and opened it now the papers were ragged soiled and stained with dampness and age and the torn edges had been joined with strips of court plaster there were two small portraits taken by a photographer in denver camilla took the photographs in her fingers and looked at them with a new interest one of the pictures was of a young woman of about camilla's age in a black beaded jersey waist and a full overskirt her front hair was done in what was known as a bang and the coils were twisted high on top of her head but even these disfigurements according to the lights of a later generation could not diminish the attractiveness of her personality there was no denying the beauty of the face the wistful eyes the straight rather short nose the sensitive lips and the deeply indented well-made chin none of the features in the least like jeff's except the last which though narrower than his had the same firm lines at the angle of the jaw it was not a weak face nor a strong one for whatever it gained at brows and chin it lost at the eyes and mouth but jeff's resemblance to his father was remarkable except for the old-fashioned collar and string tie the queerly cut coat and something in the brushing of the hair the figure in the other photograph was that of her husband in the life she had discovered this when she and jeff had looked into the tin box just after they were married and had commented on it but jeff had said nothing in reply he had only looked at the picture steadily for a moment then rather abruptly taken it from her and put it away from this camilla knew that the thoughts of his mother were the only ones which jeff had cared to select from the book of memory and tradition of his father he had never spoken nor would speak he would not even read again these letters which his mother had kept wept over and handed down to her son that the record of a man's ignominy might be kept intact for the generations to follow her it was therefore with a sense of awe of intrusion upon the mystery of a sister's tragedy that camilla opened the letters again and read them there were eight of them in all under dates from may until october eighteen seventy five all with the same superscription ned as she read camilla remembered the whole sad story and with the face of the woman before her was able to supply almost word for word the tender passionate bitter 
forgiving letters which must have come between she had pleaded with him in may to return to her but in june from new york he had written her that he could not tell when he would go west again in july he was sure he would not go west until the following year if then in august he sent her money which she must have returned for the next letter referred to it in september his manner was indifferent in october it was heartless it had taken only six months for this man madly to love and then as madly to forget camilla remembered the rest of the story as jeff had told it to her haltingly shamedly one night at mrs brennan's as it had been told to him when he was a boy by one of the nurses who had taken him away from the hospital where his mother had died of her persistent refusal to speak of jeff's father or to reveal his identity of jeff's birth without a name and of his mother's death a few weeks later unrepentant and unforgiving with her last words she had blessed the child and prayed that they would not name it after her at first he had been playfully called thomas jefferson and so thomas jefferson he remained until later another of his guardians had added the ray after a character in a book she was reading and because it sounded pretty that was jeff's christening camillo put the letters aside with the faded blue ribbon which had always accompanied them and gazed at the photograph of jeff's father yes it was a cruel face a handsome cruel face and it looked like jeff she had never thought of jeff as being cruel did she really know her husband after all until they had come to new york jeff had always been forbearing kindly and tender before their marriage he had sometimes been impatient with her but since that time often when he had every right to be angry he had contented himself with a baby-like stare and had then turned away and left her flashes of cruelty sometimes had shown in his treatment of the mexicans on the railroad or at the mines but it was not the kind of cruelty this man in the photograph had shown not the enduring cruelty of heartlessness which would let a woman die for the love of him the night jeff had left her the worst in him was dominant and yet she had not thought of him as cruel it was to the future alone which she must look for an answer to the troubled question that rose in her mind at this moment her maid entered a welcome interruption will you see mrs rumson madam oh yes celeste ask her if she won't come in here of all the friendships she had made in new york that of mrs rumson was the one camilla most deeply prized there was a tincture of old-world simplicity in her grandeur only those persons were snobbish mrs rumson always averred whose social position was insecure it was she who had helped camilla to see society as it really was laid bare to her its shams its inconsistencies and its follies who had shown her the true society of old new york taken her to unfamiliar heights among the cliff dwellers of the old regime who lived in the quiet elegance of social security with and for their friends unmoved by the glitter of modern gewgaws who resisted innovations and fought hard for old traditions which the newer generation was seeking to destroy a mild-eyed incurious race of people who were sure that what they had and were was good and viewed the social extravagances as the inhabitants of another planet might do from afar who went into the world when they chose and returned to their cliffs when they chose sure of their welcome at either place they were the people rita chain called frumps and cortland bent bores 
but to camilla who had often found herself wondering what was the end and aim of all things they were a symbol of completion mrs rumson laid aside her wraps with the deliberation of a person who is sure of her welcome you forgive my appearance asked camilla i didn't think you'd mind i'm flattered child it has taken longer than i supposed it would to teach you not to be punctilious with me well you're better of course this long rest has done wonders for you oh yes but i'm afraid i wouldn't last long here i'm used to air and sunshine and bed at ten o'clock at night she paused a moment i've been thinking of going west for a while really when i i haven't decided i thought that jeff would have returned by this time but his business still keeps him and you miss him that's very improper i'm afraid i haven't schooled you carefully enough she smiled and sighed that is a vulgar weakness your women of society must never confess to we may love our husbands as much as we like but we mustn't let people know it it offends their conceit and reminds them unpleasantly of their own deficiencies people aren't really as bad as you're trying to paint them laughed camilla even you mrs rumson why i thought the habit of cynicism was only for the very young and inexperienced thanks child perhaps it's my second childhood i don't want to be cynical but i must one reason i came to you is because i want you to refresh my point of view i wonder what air and sunshine and bed at ten o'clock would do for me would you like to prescribe it for me i wonder if you wouldn't take me west with you camilla laughed again are you really in earnest of course i'd be delighted but i'm afraid you wouldn't be the accommodations are abominable except of course in denver and you wouldn't want to stay there you know our our house isn't finished yet it would be fine if we could camp but that isn't very comfortable i love it but you know there are no porcelain tubs oh i know i've camped in the west dear a good many years ago before you were born i wonder how i should like it now she paused her wondering gaze resting on the desk which camilla had left in disorder the letters scattered the photographs at which she had been looking propped upright against the tin document box it was on the photographs that mrs rumson's gaze had stopped slowly she rose from her chair with an air of arrested attention adjusted her lorgnon and examined it at close range i thought i might have been mistaken at first she said quickly i see i'm not camilla dear where on earth did you get that photograph of the general camilla had risen the general she faltered i don't understand of my brother cornelius bent that is his photograph i have one like it in the family album at home that can't be i was looking over them only the other day why do you look so strangely are you sure you can't be sure i am i remember the queer cravat and the pose of the hands on the chair i remember him too perfectly do you think i wouldn't know my own brother oh there must be some mistake it is dreadful i can't what is dreadful child what do you mean she laid a hand on camilla's arm and camilla caught at it her nerves quivering the photograph is where did you get it it isn't mine is it or courtland's no no it has been in that tin box for more than thirty years it isn't yours it's jeff's my husband's do you understand it's his oh i can't tell you it's too horrible i can't believe it myself i don't want to believe it she sank into the chair at the desk trembling violently mrs rumson somewhat surprised and aware of the imminence of a revelation the nature of which she could not even faintly surmise bent over camilla kindly and touched her gently on the shoulder compose yourself camilla and if you think i ought to know tell me what had my brother to do with you or yours how did his picture come here camilla replied with difficulty 
that picture has been in jeff's possession since he was a baby it was the only heritage his mother left him the photograph and these letters i have just been reading them they were written to her he had deserted her before jeff was born mrs rumson's hand had dropped from camilla's shoulder and she turned quickly away with a sharp catch in her breath when she spoke her voice like camilla's was suppressed and controlled with difficulty then my brother was your husband's oh i don't know camilla broke in quickly it's all so dreadful there may be some mistake jeff will never speak of it he has tried all these years to forget i don't know why i took these letters out to read perhaps it would be better if you hadn't known no no i think i ought to know perhaps in justice to my brother there can be no justice for jeff's father mrs rumson i have read his letters to her to jeff's mother before you came in i was trying to think of a punishment horrible enough for the kind of men who deceive women as he did and then leave them to face the world alone but perhaps there was something you don't know she groped vainly every question you would ask every excuse that he could offer is answered in these letters now that you know jeff's story perhaps you had better read them with trembling hands she gathered the letters and gave them to her visitor who now sat in the big armchair near the window her straight figure almost judicial in its severity she glanced at the handwriting and at the signature and then let the papers fall into her lap yes they are my brothers she said slowly it is his handwriting and the name the general's name is cornelius edward ned was his name at college he never used his first name until later in life i-i suppose there's no doubt about it she sat with one hand to her brow as though trying to reconcile two parts of an astounding narrative camilla's revelation did not seem in the least like reality cornelius bent's part in it was so at variance with his character as she had known it there had never been time for love or for play when he had given up his profession of engineering and plunged into business downtown his youth was ended she recalled that this must have been about the time he returned from the western trip the year before he was married the making of money had been the only thing in life her brother had ever cared about he had loved his wife in his peculiar way until she died and he had been grateful for his children his membership in the blank regiment years ago had been a business move and the service though distinguished had made him many valuable business connections but all of cornelius bent's family knew that his heart and his soul were downtown day and night night and day and yet there seemed no chance that camilla could be mistaken the marks of handling the stains of time perhaps of tears the pinhole at the top these were the only differences between the photograph in her album at home and the one she now held in her fingers camilla waited for her to speak again her own heart was too full of jeff and of what this discovery might mean to him to be willing to trust herself to further speech until she was sure that her visitor understood the full meaning of the situation there was a sudden appreciation of the delicacy of her own position and of the danger to which her friendship with mrs rumson was being subjected and highly as she had prized it camilla knew that if her visitor could not take her own point of view with regard to jeff's father and with regard to jeff himself she must herself bring that friendship to an end in some anxiety she waited and watched mrs rumson while she read the proud head was bent the brows and chin had set in austere lines and camilla not knowing what to expect sat silently and waited it is true of course said her visitor softly there can't be the slightest doubt of it now there are some allusions here which identify these letters completely 
i don't know just what to say to you child from the first time i saw your husband he attracted me curiously reflected a memory you remember my speaking of it it all seems so clear to me now that the wonder is i didn't think of it myself the resemblance between the two men is striking even now yes yes i hadn't thought of that there was another silence during which mrs rumson seemed to realize what was passing in camilla's mind her sudden reticence and the meaning of it for she straightened in her chair and extended both hands warmly it is all true but my brother's faults shall make no difference in my feeling for his children if anything i should and will love them the more come and kiss me camilla dear she said with gentle simplicity and camilla her heart full of her kindness fell on her knees at mrs rumson's feet you are so good so kind she sobbed happily not at all said mrs rumson with a return of her old grenadier manner at the same time touching her handkerchief to her eyes to whom should i not be good unless to my own if my brother disowns your husband there's room enough in my own empty heart for you both camilla started back frightened her eyes shining through her tears you must not speak of this to him to general bent not yet i must think what is best for us to do no dear i'll not speak of it i'll never speak of it unless you allow me to it is your husband's affair he shall do what he thinks best as for cornelius it is a matter for my brother and his god he is forgotten perhaps it would be better if he never knew something tells me that he will learn the truth it was written years ago it will not come through me because it is not my secret to tell one thing only is certain in my mind and that is that your husband jeff must be told it is his right yes i know i must go to him it will be terrible news for him terrible i fear so i remember his once saying that if he ever found his father he'd shoot him as he would a dog as mrs rumson drew back in alarm she added quickly oh no of course he didn't mean that that was just jeff's way of expressing himself as camilla rose mrs rumson sighed deeply i don't suppose i have any right to plead for my brother but you and jeff must do him justice too all this happened a long while ago between that time and this lie thirty years of good citizenship and honorable manhood cornelius has been no despoiler of women she picked up the papers again the curious thing about it camilla is that nowhere in these letters is there any mention of a child i can't understand that have you thought that perhaps he did not know it's very strange mystifying i had never known the real heart of my brother but he could hardly have been capable of that he was never given at any time to show his feelings even to his wife or his family have you thought that perhaps he loved jeff's mother i hope i pray that he did perhaps if jeff could believe that but the letters no mrs rumson no man who'd ever loved could have written that last letter but you must do what you can to make your husband see the best of it camilla that is your duty child don't you see it that way camilla was kneeling on a chair her elbows on its back her fingers wreathing her brows yes i suppose so she sighed but i'm afraid in this matter jeff will not ask my opinions he must choose for himself i don't know what he will do or say you could hardly expect him to show filial devotion gladys and cortland she rose in a new dismay and walked to the window i had not thought of them her visitor followed camilla with questioning eyes they must share in the burden it is theirs too she put in after a moment it is very hard for me to know what to do it is harder now than it would have been before this fight of the amalgamated for the smelter they are enemies don't you suppose i hear the talk about it 
general bent has sworn to ruin jeff to put him out of business and jeff will fight until he drops father against son oh mrs rumson what can be done she took the photograph and letters from the lap of her visitor and stood before the mantel if i burn them no no mrs rumson had risen quickly and seized camilla by the arm you mustn't do that it would save so much pain no one saved her pain you have no right who are you to play the part of providence to two human souls this drama was arranged years before you were born it's none of your affair fate has simply used you used us as humble instruments in working out its plans camilla shook her head it can do jeff no good it will do gladys and cortland harm jeff has forgotten the past it has done him no harm except that he has no name he has won his way without a name even this will not give him one jeff's poor incubus will be a grim reality tangible flesh to be despised mrs rumson looked long into the fire i can't believe it she said slowly my brother and i are not on the best of terms we have never been intimate because we could not understand each other but he is not the kind of man any one despises people downtown say he has no soul if he hasn't then this news can be no blow to him if he has she paused and then instead of going on took camilla by the hand camilla she said gently we must think long over this but not now it must be slept on get dressed while i read these letters and we'll take a spin into the country perhaps by to-morrow we'll be able to see things more clearly End of chapter 17